Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 4. 1921-1922. Chapter 26. Banishment. In May, 1922, my book, The Influence of Hunger on Human Behavior, on Social Life and Social Organization, began to be printed. Before publication many paragraphs, indeed whole chapters were cut out by the censors. The book as a whole was ruined, but what remained was better than nothing. The Soviets' war on the ideological front was now being carried on with great energy. The autonomy of the university had been completely annihilated. Rectors, deans, and professors were dismissed, university and faculty meetings were forbidden. Many non-communist students were expelled. Only the communists and youths recommended by the government were permitted to enter the schools. All non-communist journals and magazines were suppressed. Cooperative organizations which had grown up in the last months were governmentalized. We all lived from hand to mouth, expecting every day some new blow. Nevertheless, we were not entirely without hope. The country was showing unmistakable signs of regeneration. Under the ruins of our civilization, in the depths of the people's hearts and souls, something was stirring, the life and spirit of a new people. Whatever might happen to us, the new birth of Russia was a certainty. Time only was necessary for these new forces to grow strong enough to make themselves felt. We could wait, for the years had trained us in patience. What were these new creative forces? Let us not speak about them here, for the time has not come to speak without endangering their growth. When the time is ripe, the world will see them. On August 10, 1922, I left Petrograd for a few days in Moscow. From the station I went directly to the apartment of a friend who had invited me to stay with him. We had breakfast and parted, arranging to meet at five o'clock in his apartment. Having attended to my business and visited friends, I returned to the apartment, but my friend was not at home. At six he had not come and I became a little uneasy. At seven a student came, asking for my friend's wife. I told him that neither she nor her husband were at home, and offered to take any message he cared to leave. The student looked at me fixedly and asked. Who are you? I introduced myself, and he said. Professor, get out of this apartment. Your friend is under arrest and the checkists may be here any moment. I took my bag and left, but I waited near the house until I saw my friend's wife approaching, and having agreed with her about our immediate plans, I went to the apartment of another friend. Alas, he, too, had been arrested. A few hours later we learned that Professors Kizavetter and Frank, Berdiev and Yasinski, Sofronov and Ozerov, Myakadin and Peshikhanov, Osorjan and many others, prominent scientists and scholars, writers and cooperative workers, in all about 150, had in a single day been arrested. Many students also had been taken. A big terror was evidently beginning and might be appearing also in Petrograd. All doubt on this score was removed next day when I read a telegram sent by my wife to a friend in Moscow. This telegram read, Please detain my son. We have scarlet fever in our house. We soon learned how timely was this warning for me to remain away from my Petrograd lodgings. In that city were arrested professors Lowsky, Karsovin, Zubashev, Ludikin, Lapshin, Odintsov, Selivanov, Brutskis, Zaniadin, and others, about 100 in all, with many students. The Czechists had gone to my Petrograd address, and there, in Mrs. D's apartment, they found her second daughter, Nadia, dying. Nadia's husband and the physician assured the Czechists that I was not in the apartment, and they begged the men not to torment the dying woman with futile searching. The Czechists went through all the rooms, and finding that I was not concealed there, they generously agreed to make no more noise and to leave no guard behind. I remained in Moscow comparatively safe, for not very many people knew me by sight. I went to concerts and theaters, visited museums and even the library of the Communist Academy. A week passed, and rumors about the arrested scholars and professors began to be circulated. It was said that they were not to be executed but banished. Soon in Pravda an article by Trotsky gave official authority to these rumors. 
These people, said Trotsky's article, cannot and will not make peace with communism. As soon as any new political disturbances begin we are obliged to massacre them as our bitterest enemies. In order to avoid these massacres, let us export these wares abroad. Banishing them, we get rid of our worst foes. Remaining enemies may be bribed and made harmless. Thus we weaken the forces acting against us and reinforce our own bases. The arrested people began to be released, the authorities warning them that they were to be banished. Each man had to sign two papers, one promising that in ten days he would leave the country, and the other declaring that if they returned to Russia without permission of the Soviet government they would be executed. If a man protested that he was without money or even without visa to enter a foreign country, the authorities said. Get visa. If not your banishment will be to the north of Siberia. Therefore the victims got visa, and as it unexpectedly turned out, without much difficulty, the governments of Czechoslovakia, Germany, Latvia and Estonia granting them at once and without formalities. As soon as the fate of my arrested colleagues became known, I decided that my own banishment abroad was the best thing that could happen. I could do nothing more for my country, I was living illegally, and sooner or later would certainly be arrested. When arrested I could expect either endless imprisonment or death by starvation and cold in northern Siberia. If I were to live at all I ought to live usefully, and so long had I been cut off from foreign scientific literature that I hardly knew what had been written. All these motives urged me not to miss this favorable moment for banishment, and so I started at once to Petrograd to be arrested. It was a lovely September morning when I reached Tsarsko Selo. My wife was away from the house, so I began myself to prepare my prison bag, packing it with food and linen, and with two or three books with which to beguile the tedium of prison life. When my wife returned, she tried at once to dissuade me from my purpose, because all those who had been arrested in the kingdom of Grishka III were still in prison and no one knew whether or not he would be banished with the people in Moscow. My wife showed me copies of the Petrograd Pravda and the Red Paper, in which I was furiously assailed and threatened. Still I thought I had better be arrested, and with my prison bag on my back I started for Petrograd, my wife accompanying me. On the way we met friends, who joined with my wife in calling me quite mad to venture into Petrograd. If Zinoviev and his crew do not shoot you at once, they said, you will be banished to Siberia, and not to any foreign country. Finally, I agreed that it might be better for me to be arrested in Moscow, and next morning I went there. With my prison bag I presented myself at the Cheka, and after some time was admitted to the office of the official in charge of the affair of the banished scholars and scientists. My name is Sorokin, I said to him. Your comrades in Petrograd went to arrest me but I was here in Moscow. I have come to you to know what you wish to do with me. The Czechist, a young man with the white face of a cocaine addict, waved his hand, saying. We have plenty of people in Moscow with whom we don't know what to do. Go back to Petrograd and let the Cheka there decide your fate. Thank you, I said, I will not go back to Petrograd. If you want to arrest me, here I am. If not, as a free citizen I choose to remain in Moscow, or in any other part of Russia rather than in Petrograd. That is an impossible answer. He said, but after a moment's thought he added. Well, all arrested university people are to be banished abroad. Sign these two papers, and in ten days leave the territory of the R.S.F.S.R. Willingly I signed and asked her I was to apply for my passport. In the Commissariat of Foreign Affairs. Answered the pale young man. I am just going to tell them of you. May I leave here? Oh, certainly. Going out of the Cheka office I sent a telegram to my wife to sell all our belongings and to join me in Moscow. There was nothing much except the remnants of my library to sell, therefore her task was light. I should have preferred to leave Russia via Petrograd and Hamburg, but knowing the methods of Zinoviev and the Petrograd Cheka in arresting people without waiting for permission of the central government, I decided on the route from Moscow to Riga. And I decided to leave quickly. The process of getting passports and permissions was difficult and irritating. At the Commissariat of Foreign Affairs they told me that it would be five or six days before my passport would be ready. 
But if I am to leave Russia in ten days there will not be time left for me to get my visa and all the permissions of your damned commissariats, I said. That is not our affair. They said indifferently. It is your affair, since your government is banishing me in ten days, I insisted. Well, you can have your passport in three days then. I must have it tomorrow. It is impossible. Determined to make it possible I went to Karakhan, acting Minister of Foreign Affairs in the absence of Shishirin. Karakhan had been a friend of my student days, and I thought it might be amusing to see him now a Bolshevist official. But when I offered my card to his secretary the fellow declared that Karakhan was busy and could not give me an audience. At the moment a man entered the room and greeted me. He was one of my old students in the Psychoneurological Institute. What are you doing here? I asked. Oh, I am head of the Information and Publicity Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He answered proudly. Have you read in the newspapers articles by Koltsov? That is my pen name. I said that I had read them and he asked eagerly what I thought of them. The same as of your government, I replied. Now this fellow here refuses to send my card in to his excellency. Please make him do it. They whispered a moment and disappeared. Soon Karakhan appeared at the door, which was guarded by three Czechists. How do you do, Piterim Alexandrovic? He said. I am glad to see you. Come in. The room was comfortably, even luxuriously furnished, and Karakhan, once a lean and spare man, now looked well fed and fat. Your Excellency, I said, half jokingly. You know, of course, that I am exiled. Your subordinates refuse to give me a passport before three days, and that inconveniences me. Will you be so kind as to order them to have my passport ready by tomorrow morning? With great pleasure. He answered, and over the telephone gave the order. Tomorrow it will be ready for you. He announced. And it will be given you free of any charge. I thanked him, although it had not been my intention to pay for the passport. Not the next morning but the next after that did I get the passport, Expulsi, was written on it in French. That same day I got Czechoslovakian, German, Lettish, and Lithuanian visa. Now I had to get many licenses, and the permission of the Commissariat of Education to take with me some of my manuscripts, one copy each of books, articles, and pamphlets published by me. Then the permission of the Commissariat of Foreign Trade to take with us one old overcoat, two old suits, two towels, two sheets, five shirts, and five trousers. The permission of the Commissariat of Finances was necessary in order to take fifty dollars, one watch and two wedding rings. Three days I spent getting these cursed permits. All my manuscripts were carefully revised, numbered, and sealed by the censors. A great deal of suspicion was aroused by the botanical materials of my wife. Only by many assurances were they convinced that there was nothing counter-revolutionary or secret in these innocent herbariums and botanical preparations. In the Commissariat of Finances, what was our surprise to be given our permission by one of our own colleagues, a man who, like ourselves, had been sentenced to banishment. At the last minute he was suddenly forbidden to go abroad and was sent back to his old employment. A banished criminal yesterday, today he was a Soviet official granting licenses to his erstwhile fellow criminals. It was impossible not to laugh at such an absurdity. About the last visit I paid was to communist leader Pyatikov, a man with whom in student days I had been friends. I went to see him in behalf of a former comrade of us both, a man in prison and seriously ill. Pyatikov promised to do what he could, and after finishing that business, he told me that he was about to write an article on my criticism of Bukharin's work, The Theory of Marxism. I said to him, Pyatikov, let me ask you, do you really believe that you are creating a communistic society? Of course not. He replied frankly. You admit that your experiment has failed, and that you are building only a primitive bourgeois society. Why then are you banishing us? You do not take into consideration. Said the man. That two processes are going on in Russia. One is the recreation of a bourgeois society, the other is a process of the adaptation of the Soviet government to it. 
the first process is going on faster than the second. This involves a danger to our existence. Our task is to delay the development of that first process, but you and the others who are to be exiled are accelerating it. That is why you are banished. Perhaps after two or three years we will invite you to come back. Thank you, I said, I hope to return to my country, without your invitation. On a grey afternoon, September 23, 1922, the first group of exiles gathered at the Moscow railway station. The Board of the Agricultural Cooperative Union and other prominent cooperative workers, Peshinov, a former member of Kerensky's ministry, Professor Mayakadin, a leader in the People's Socialistic Party, their wives and children, my wife and I were in this first group. Into the Lettish diplomatic car, reserved by me, I took our two valises. Omnia mea mecum porto, I could say of myself. In a pair of shoes sent me by a Czech scientist, a suit given by the American Relief Administration, and with fifty dollars in my pocket I left my native land. All my companions were in similar plight, but none of us worried very much. The standard of life on which we had lived for so long we could certainly establish anywhere in the world. In spite of prohibitions of the authorities, many friends and acquaintances came to see us off, with gifts of flowers, handclasps, and tears. Their faces, the disappearing streets of Moscow, the last sight of the fatherland we devoured with all our eyes. As we traveled on we took from our pockets and read letters sent all of us in secret by peasant cooperative organizations, by students, professors, workers, and other people. You are expelled not by the people, but by the internationalist dregs. Said these farewell letters. Russia is with you and you are with Russia. Russia suffers and you suffer. When the day of Russia comes, you will be with us again. Then we destroyed them lest they fall into Czechist hands at the frontier. Next day we reached Sebej, the boundary line of Russia. Our greetings to Moscow, greetings to Petrograd, greetings to Novgorod, we telegraphed back, while the Czechists searched our bags. Half an hour later we passed a red flag, and Soviet Russia was behind us. That night, after five years, we lay down to sleep without asking ourselves, will they come tonight or not? A week later in Berlin I delivered my first lecture on the present condition in Russia. It became clear that I left none too soon, for the first letters that reached me said that. Our grandmother. The Cheka. Is very sorry for having let you go without giving you her last and eternal blessing. Execution. In a Berlin newspaper, days, I read that. At a meeting of the people's commissaries in Moscow the head of the Cheka, Comrade Unschleicht, and commissary of the Foreign Office, Karakhan were censured by the other commissaries for allowing Mrs. Koskova and Professor Sorokin to go abroad. At the same time my book about famine was destroyed by the Soviet government. Invited by President Masaryk, I went to Prague and had the pleasure of meeting him, as well as other prominent representatives of Czechoslovak society. Here I resumed my work and wrote my Sociology of Revolution. With many friends, I worked to establish magazines, The Farm and the Peasants Russia, and to help the Agricultural Institute and Agricultural and Cooperative Schools in Czechoslovakia for the training of peasant leaders of future Russia. Many thousand students are educating themselves and others for the regeneration of our fatherland. With them I had the joy of entering into communication with people in Soviet Russia. Our new, strong, and creative life has been growing both at home and abroad. In November, 1923, I came to this great country, on invitation, to lecture before American universities. Here I have written from my journals and from memory, these recollections. Whatever may happen in the future, I know that I have learned three things which will remain forever convictions of my heart as well as my mind. Life, even the hardest life, is the most beautiful, wonderful and miraculous treasure in the world. Fulfillment of duty is another beautiful thing, making life happy and giving to the soul an inconquerable force to sustain ideals. This is my second conviction, and my third is that cruelty, hatred, and injustice never can and never will be able to create a mental, moral, or material millennium.